This is Nightly Business Report with Bill Griffith and Sue Herrera. Stocks tumble, concerns over trade and global growth mount, and the market retreats. Banking powerhouse BB&T and SunTrust are combining to create one of the country's largest banks, making this the biggest banking deal since the financial crisis. Truck revolution, how America's love affair with big vehicles is reshaping how the automakers spend and hire. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Thursday, February 7th. And we do bid you a good evening, everybody, and welcome. So stocks did head south today after investors were hit with a one-two punch of trade and global growth concerns. Let's start with trade. The latest is that talks between the U.S. and China may not be progressing as quickly as the market would like, especially ahead of that key tariff deadline now set for March 1st. And that sparked concerns that the trade war between the world's two largest economies will not be coming to a quick resolution after all. At the close today, the Dow was down 220 points. Not the low of the day, though. We're at 25,169. The Nasdaq was down 86. The S&P slid by 25. Bob Bassani has more on today's stock slide. A number of headlines have stirred up fears about the U.S.-China trade war. So just before 11 a.m. Eastern time, reports were out saying White House National Economic Director Larry Kudlow said there is a pretty sizable distance to go right now for the two world powers to reach a trade deal. Moments later, sources told CNBC that President Donald Trump was unlikely to meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping before the March 1st trade truce deadline. That's adding further fuel to the fire and sparking concerns that the trade wars might pick up right where they left off 90 days days ago. So the markets had been patiently optimistic about a trade deal over the past few weeks and months, but prospects are maybe a little dimmer now. When asked directly whether we had planned a meeting with Xi, Trump told the press, not yet. No surprise then that defensive sectors like real estate utilities were the lone groups trading in the green. Big multinational groups like materials and energy names lagged on the session. Industrials like Boeing, Caterpillar, 3M, they also dragged the Dow deeper into the red. On top of that, Europe showed more signs of a global economic slowdown overnight, and that stoked still more fears about a weaker macro backdrop. One bright spot today was the regional banks, particularly SunTrust and BB&T, after they announced a $66 billion merger. The bank stocks have rallied 16% so far this year, but they're still facing tougher conditions thanks to low rates and tepid loan growth. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Bassani at the New York Stock Exchange. Bob just mentioned those renewed fears of a slowdown in global growth, which is something that we talked about yesterday. But today, it was once again a big focus for investors. Steve Leisman has more. Just a few months ago, markets fretted about global central banks ending their easy monetary policies. Now, faster than you can say global central bank policy reversal, those same banks are slashing their growth forecasts, dialing back plans to tighten policy, and in some cases, even easing interest rates. Today, the Bank of England, citing global trade tensions and concern over Brexit, cut its growth forecast for 2019 by half a point to 1.2 percent. Some analysts who thought the Bank of England would hike twice this year now see no hikes. In the U.S. last week, the Fed shifted from a policy of gradually increasing rates to a policy of being patient, figuring out what its next move will be. Fed officials still see the U.S. economy on solid footing, but global economic weakness is clearly their biggest worry. You look at what the risks are, and I think global risks are probably the, uh, the most significant ones, and that will be what you know, I at least will be looking at uh, over the course of the next six months is how does that evolve. Forecasters now see that evolution more to the downside. The European Union shaved 0.6 percentage points from its annual outlook, bringing it down to 1.3 percent. Australia's bank shifted into neutral, and India even lowered rates. The People's Bank of China cut its bank reserve requirements, making it easier for banks to lend. It's not her base case, but former Fed Chair Janet Yellen believes that the gathering global clouds could prompt the Fed to cut rates as its next move. Would you say that it's possible the next move is a cut by well, the Fed? I, of course it's possible if... Uh, global growth really weakens and that spills over to the United States or financial conditions um, tighten more and we do see a weakening in the U.S. Mm -hmm. economy, it's, it's certainly possible that the next move is a cut. But both, both 
outcomes are possible. What the U.S. Fed ultimately does will depend on how much that weakness washes up on American shores. A U.S.-China trade deal could alleviate at least some of the worries, but it's not clear if that will happen fast enough or will be enough on its own to eliminate the gathering global risks. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leesman. Now to something we have not talked about in years, a bank merger. Today, two big regional powerhouses, BB&T and SunTrust, agreed to combine, creating the sixth largest financial institution in the country. And believe it or not, it is the biggest U.S. bank deal in a decade. And Wall Street liked what it heard. Both stocks gained. SunTrust was up 10 percent today. BB&T was up 4 percent. Wilfred Frost has more on this $66 billion deal. The combination of BB&T and SunTrust will be one of the dominant forces in the southeast region, becoming the third biggest bank in the area by deposits. It falls behind Bank of America and Wells Fargo, whose stocks declined today in light of the extra competition, as did JP Morgan's, who have a big presence in Florida. The deal strikes a perfect sweet spot. The combined bank will not be subject to more stringent regulation because it's not big enough to be considered strategically important. And there are plenty of synergies, most notably the ability to close branches, 24% of which are within two miles of each other. It will also allow increased investment in technology, a key area highlighted by BB&T CEO Kelly King, who will also now serve as the chairman and CEO of the combined bank. Our clients now demand what I call real-time satisfaction. They want what they want, when they want it, right here, right now. Uh, and so we are all facing uh, an increasing set of complex economic realities where we have to invest more and more in technology. More consolidation could follow in the industry, more likely among smaller banks than involving the top five U.S. banks where regulatory hurdles would be significant. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Wilfred Frost. So could today's bank merger lead to more regional bank deals? Gerard Cassidy, banking analyst at RBC Capital Markets, joins us now to talk about that. And I guess that is the question. Uh, will this lead to more? And, and how did the, why did the atmosphere change where we get a deal now? Because it's one of the biggest ones since the financial crisis. Uh, thank you for inviting me on the show, Sue. And I would say that a couple of key factors have started to come up. First and foremost, and it was already discussed, the regulators changed the way they're going to regulate banks between $250 billion and $700 billion in assets. And that change was proposed last fall. And we published at the time that this was a green light, we thought, for bigger bank mergers. And so that was one of the catalysts why we're seeing it today. But I'd also point out that the banking industry has been consolidating for over 30 years. Back in the 80s, we mm -hmm. had 14,000 banks. Today, we have 5,700. It kind of went on pause because of the financial crisis right. amongst the big banks. And now we're back on track. And now the Fed's on hold, so interest rates are not going to go much higher from here. That's not good for the banks. Loan portfolio growth has slowed a bit, so they got to find growth somewhere. And I guess that's why you're thinking we're going to see more uh, consolidation down the road. So who's ripe for this kind of consolidation? What kind of a bank do you look for to decide whether it's going to be uh, bought or do the buying? It's an interesting question because I think it spans a variety of banks in size. It could be a small, you know, small banks in the billion in asset, billion in asset size, all the way up to another couple hundred billion dollar in asset size bank. Up until this deal, as you pointed out, this is the biggest deal in over 10 years. Uh, most of the deals we've seen are quite small. Last year there were 259 bank deals, but they were very small. So as we go forward, I think big regional banks could combine together like we just saw today with the uh, announcement that we uh, from the uh, SunTrust and BB&T. But also, we could see smaller banks continue to sell out. Economies of scale will drive this consolidation. As we know, banking is a commodity product. The low-cost producers are the right. going to come out to the winners. On that note, Gerard Cassidy with RBC Capital Markets, thank you. Thank you. And there is cautious optimism on Capitol Hill tonight where lawmakers are trying to hammer out their differences on border security and come up with a uh, spending bill that averts another government shutdown. Ilan Mui is in Washington for us tonight. The federal government runs out of money on February 15th. That means negotiators need to come to an agreement in the coming days in order to comply with the official rules for passing a bill through both the House and the Senate. 
Today, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said she has confidence that members can work out a compromise. I have asked the administration to be as non-interventionist as I am on that. Just let them do their work. And hopefully that will, will get some good news in a short period of time, and certainly in time uh, for the deadline of February 15th. Senator Richard Shelby, the top Republican in the talks, met with President Trump today to brief him on the status of the discussions. Nothing is final yet, but Republicans say they need three things to get to yes. More agents, new technology, and a border barrier. Now, GOP negotiators are staying away from using the word wall, and that could open the door to a deal with Democrats over a physical infrastructure. One Democrat on the negotiating team says he backs a, quote, enhanced border barrier. Another sticking point is the money. Democrats started at $1.8 billion. That's likely to go up. But Senator Dick Durbin, the top Democrat in the discussions, said they haven't settled on a number just yet. But the big X factor in all of this is whether the president will sign what Congress sends him. Republican Senator John Barrasso said he's urging Trump to accept the deal. And that's a decision he's going to make. You know, I would say follow Ronald Reagan's approach, which is if you don't get the whole life loaf, take it a slice at a time and then go back and get more. Trump has called these discussions a waste of time, but he's also said he wants to see this process play out. So we'll see where the president stands if and when lawmakers reach a compromise. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Elon Moy in Washington. Lawmakers across the Atlantic are also trying to hammer out their differences when it comes to how Britain will exit the European Union. So-called Brexit is considered a big risk for the global economy, and right now things are not going the way Prime Minister Theresa May would like. Villa Marx in Brussels tonight. The flag of an EU member state flies outside the European Commission whenever that country's leader visits Brussels. That means the Union Jack could soon become a rather rare sight here. But recently it's appeared as frequently as Prime Minister Theresa May, who's returned in search of a conclusive but elusive Brexit handshake. For her latest rehearsal run, first up was Jean-Claude Juncker, Europe's chief executive, who greeted the British leader. Alongside a host of difficult questions... So have you brought spe specific proposals today? Can you win changes to the deal, Prime Minister? And a joke about May's Brexit demons. Held, that infernal reference was to EU Council President Donald Tusk, who yesterday derided the British politicians he says pushed Brexit without a workable proposal. By the way, I've been wondering what that special place in hell looks like for those who promoted Brexit without even a sketch of a plan how to carry it safely. This sit-down on Thursday has yielded yet more meetings next Monday. And all the while, May's self-imposed late March departure deadline marches ever closer. Now, it's not going to be easy, but crucially, President Juncker and I have agreed that talks will now uh, start to find a way through this, to find a way to get this over the line and to deliver on the concerns that Parliament has so we get a majority in Parliament. The focus in Downing Street is the next big Brexit vote on Wednesday with many of May's own party still concerned the current agreement could undermine Britain's future sovereignty. The British Prime Minister has in recent months repeatedly failed to win over members of her own parliament in Westminster. And there was little indication today she had any more success here in Brussels with the EU legislature, which also has veto power over any proposed changes to the current Brexit deal. It is the only solution that guarantees an ordinary UK exit. It is the only solution that protects peace in Ireland and the integrity of the internal market. And as May continues on to Dublin tomorrow, attention remains just to the north, in a border region that could soon separate the UK and Ireland and, in turn, Europe. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Willem Marx in Brussels. Time to take a look at a couple of today's upgrades and downgrades. Guess was upgraded to buy from hold at Jefferies. The analyst said the company is one of the few retailers with an opportunity for both sales growth and margin expansion. Price target is now $24 and shares rose 4% to $21.04. Brazilian mining company Vale was downgraded to equal weight from overweight at Morgan Stanley. The analyst cites continued uncertainty following a recent dam accident. That uncertainty also prompted the analyst to remove his price target for the stock. The shares were down more than 1.5% to 11.17 on the session. 
Still ahead, Twitter is turning into a big spender, and investors are not exactly retweeting the plan. Amazingly, Sears has officially been saved from liquidation. A bankruptcy judge today approved a deal to sell the major uh, remaining assets of Sears to its chairman and largest shareholder, Edward Lampert, who runs ESL Investments. That says that the $5.2 billion deal to buy the company will save 425 stores and about 45,000 jobs. It was a rough day for Twitter, despite reporting better-than-expected earnings and revenue. Investors focused on the social media company's guidance, which was light, and added that expenses will increase a lot. That sent the stock down about 10 percent. Julia Borston has more. Twitter is increasing its spending, hiring more employees and investing to improve the conversations on the platform and cut down on the abuse. But that plan isn't going over so well with investors. CFO Ned Siegel saying the investments make sense, though, as they work on improving the platform. If you look at the 500 or so people that we added to the team last year, more than half of them were in our engineering product design and research organization. So we're trying to build technology advantage that can be scalable, that can be durable, and that can help us solve the problems and help people find the things that they're looking for on Twitter faster. Twitter's monthly active user numbers were right in line with expectations, yet falling from the previous quarter. But the company announcing it's going to switch to reporting daily users. That number increased by 2 million to 126 million. Siegel saying this increases transparency and doesn't change anything about the way advertisers pay to target their messages. It's nothing new for advertisers. Uh, they come to Twitter with a specific objective in mind to launch a new product or service to connect with what's happening. Uh, they uh, tell us what audience they want to reach or what part of the world or demographic they want to reach and we help them realize their objective. But some analysts raising concerns around the decision to stop reporting the monthly number that's been a constant for Twitter since its 2013 IPO. When you change the goalpost, no matter how articulate your argument is for doing so, there's usually a bad reason. And so I take this as a negative. As for what will drive Twitter's next leg of growth, Siegel saying most of their revenue is from big brands, and they're working to make it easier for small and medium businesses to spend on the platform. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. Tapestry find itself out of fashion, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The luxury retailer cut its full year profit forecast today after reporting its first quarterly miss in two years. The company cited weak sales of its Kate Spade brand and the slowing and global economy we've been talking about. Tapestry also owns the Coach and Stuart Weitzman's brands. Shares fell about 15 percent today to 33.48 and touched a 52 week low in the process. Elsewhere, Yum! Brands missed quarterly profit estimates as it spent aggressively on promotions to lift sluggish sales at its Pizza Hut locations. But strong performances at KFC and Taco Bell did help the company to top same-store sales forecasts. Yum! also announced a deal with Taco Bell launching nationwide delivery through Grubhub, which Yum! CEO says is part of a long-term plan to grow sales. It's about making sure that the, the brands are relevant. It's about making sure they're distinctive. And then I think the newest attribute is how do you make it easy? And obviously Pizza Hut does it, Taco Bell now doing delivery, KFC getting into the delivery business. So I think delivery is the next way to make it easier for customers to access what I think are relevant and distinctive brands. Shares of Yum! Brands gained two cents today to 94.61. Meanwhile, earnings at Duncan Brands topped estimates, but revenues came in lower than expected as U.S. same-store sales were flat. The company says it's been focused on rolling out espresso drinks as part of a long-term strategy to attract more coffee drinkers. We really like what we're seeing in terms of the consumer reaction. It skews younger. It skews towards the afternoon. 
we're getting new guests, and we're also getting that important switcher. Those people who switch from brand to brand, we get those switchers back as well. So we really like uh, how that's performed over the first 10 weeks. But investors seem focused on the lower revenue numbers, and shares fell 3% to 66.79. Kellogg's posted an earnings beat on an adjusted basis, but the non-adjusted numbers were negative as the company invests in new cereals and snacks. Those investments could lead to higher sales, as Kellogg sees sales up between 3 and 4 percent this year. But it could come at the expense of earnings, as the company expects them to fall as much as 7 percent for the year. And that was more than what Wall Street wanted to see. So Kellogg's shares fell more than 5.5 percent to 55.84. Tyson Foods reported weaker than expected quarterly sales. The largest U.S. meat producer is facing lower pork prices and a drop in demand for chicken. But the company reaffirmed its outlook, saying Chinese demand for pork may increase given the severe outbreak of African swine fever in that country, and that is forcing some producers to call their herds. The stock fell more than 1 percent to $60.12. And that outbreak of the African swine flu came as a surprise to authorities in China who are scrambling to fight the spread of that disease through the world's biggest pork market. And that's just adding pressure to a sector of the Chinese economy that's already in the middle of a trade war. Yunus Yun is in Wudi for us tonight. China's tariffs were meant to hit American pig farms, but not Thai Lin's. I would say tariffs are hurting the wrong people in the short term and might create unintended consequences. To retaliate against President Trump's tariffs, the Chinese raised duties on American pork last year to a total of 62 percent. But even the pig business is global. This farm in eastern China is 100 percent American. Lin's U.S. private equity fund, Proterra, along with an American hog farming company, invested $100 million in the complex four years ago. Last year, the farms sold 500,000 pigs. The Chinese eat more pork than anyone else in the world, as much as the rest of the world combined. Lin's pigs have been in even greater demand since an African swine fever epidemic hit the local industry last summer. We're using automatic feeder systems. He says U.S. technology and standards helped him avoid the disease. The slaughterhouses will see our meat as safe and high quality, and so they will pay a slight premium over the market price. The epidemic also gave a boost to farmers in the U.S. At first, pork imports from America tanked when the tariffs hit. But the swine fever created pork shortages in certain provinces. The outbreak of African swine fever here forced China to import American pork anyway, despite the tariffs. As we go deeper into 2019, prices should come back up again because the total stock of live hog is just really low. And it also happens to be the year of the pig. So uh, it should be a lucky year for pigs. And American pig farmers. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Yunus Yun in Wudi, Shandong Province. Coming up, the road ahead, why some auto plants are closing while others are expanding. Fiat Chrysler sees a bumpy road ahead for 2019. The automaker issued a weaker-than-expected outlook after reporting disappointing sales in North America, which is a key market for the company. The CEO said the company is also trying to navigate the Chinese market, which weakened in the second half of last year. That sent shares down 12 percent in today's session. Meanwhile, Ford is investing $1 billion to beef up SUV production at its plants in Chicago. It's just the latest example of automakers spending and hiring at factories that build trucks while cutting jobs and shutting down assembly lines that build cars. Phil LeBeau has more. Ford's big investment on the south side of Chicago is proof the SUV boom is rolling on. In order to build the new Explorer, Ford is adding 500 jobs and investing a billion dollars in its Chicago plants. When it's all finished, Chicago Assembly will have an all-new state-of-the-art body shop, an all-new paint shop, 
and new tooling to build this new lineup. Why are automakers putting more workers and money into some assembly plants while shutting down others? It's all about America's truck revolution. Over the last five years, as truck and SUV sales have soared, car sales have plunged. So assembly plants like GM's in Lordstown, Ohio, which builds the Chevy Cruze, will soon be idle. Ford's Flat Rock plant outside Detroit, which builds the Mustang and Lincoln Continental, will soon cut a shift. The fact is America's demand for trucks and SUVs is forcing automakers to change what they build and where they build it. Take Fiat Chrysler. It will add assembly lines to build more Jeeps, perhaps the hottest brand in showrooms, or Mercedes and BMW. Both hired more workers at plants in the Deep South where they build popular SUVs. The changing landscape of auto manufacturing in the U.S. is painful for thousands of workers losing jobs at plants that build sedans. But overall, this is an industry that has steadily added manufacturing jobs over the last decade. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. Here's a look at the final numbers on Wall Street. The Dow fell 220 points. NASDAQ down 86. S&P 500 slid 25. And that will do it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a lovely evening. Hope to see you tomorrow.